Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 10. In this part, I'm going to teach you Kepler's third law, which governs the period of orbits. In the last part, I determined the timing of an orbit along an ellipse. We did that by starting at the periapsis point and adding delta thetas that swept out equal areas in equal time. In the last part, I showed you some Python code that produced this animation. The two ellipses in this animation have the same period, which turns out to be wrong. I'll show you how to correct that in this part. We'll fix this with Kepler's third law. He derived this 10 years after deriving his first two laws. His third law states that the square of the orbital period of a planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of the orbit. Here are the semi-major axes of the planets. I got this from Wikipedia. And here's what all the planets look like graphically. The outer planets are very far away from the sun, so much so that it's hard to see the concentric circles of the inner planets, so I show them separ separately. The solar system is pretty big. Here's an animation that just demonstrates Kepler's third law for the inner planets. Mercury has the smallest semi-major axis and thus travels along its orbit faster. Of the inner planets, Mars has the longest semi-major axis and travels the slowest over the longest path. Here are the outer planets, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. Uranus has a huge semi-major axis and travels slowest and farthest of all the planets. Here are the orbital periods of each of the planets in Earth years. Earth's period is thus one Earth year. Mercury is about a quarter of a year. Neptune is just short of 165 Earth years. This column is the cube of each of the semi-major axes. Kepler's third law states that the square of the orbital period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. This column is the square of each of the periods. And here's the ratio of each of the periods squared over each of the semi-major axes cubed. Notice that the ratios are not precisely the same. The inner planets from Mars to Mercury are pretty close. The outer planets are off a bit. Kepler's third law was the most accurate, accurate prediction in his day, a vast improvement over the Ptolemaic system, but it wasn't perfect. Suffice it to say that the square of the periods of each of the planets is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis with the same constant of proportionality. Here are the eccentricities. They vary from planet to planet. Mercury has the most eccentric orbit. Many of these are nearly circular. Eccentricity has no bearing, however, on Kepler's third law. The period of an orbit is solely a function of the semi-major axis, not the eccentricity or the shape of the ellipse. The ratios 3.3 times 10 to the 24th are only good for planets orbiting the sun. Here are the parameters for the moon. The moon orbits the Earth. Its semi-major axis and period is in relation to the Earth. Look at the ratio column. It's just over 10. That's a much different value than the one for the planets orbiting the sun. Kepler's third law states that the square of the orbital period is directly proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis, but that only holds for a common central body. Satellites orbiting the Earth would have a ratio of 10.1515. Another central body would have a different ratio or constant of, propor of proportionality. For instance, if we were to consider the moons of Jupiter, we'd use a different constant. There's an easier way to, to deal with the constant of proportionality for Kepler's third law. Let me call the distance from the Earth to the Sun one astronomical unit. Here are the semi-major axes for the planets in astronomical units. The next column, the period, stays the same. Notice that the Earth semi-major axis is one astronomical unit and the period is one year. So guess what the constant of proportionality will be? Here's the semi-major axis cubed. Notice that it's nearly identical to the period squared. And then here's the ratio. It's exactly one in most cases. For Earth, one cubed is one and one squared is one, hence the ratio or the constant of proportionality is one. That means the ratios for all the other planets are one. Using standard units like this makes the ratios trivial. We can use Kepler's third law to determine the distance of the planets from the sun. 
The periods are easy to measure. We can do that from the Earth. People of Kepler's day had no way to measure the distances. Even today, it's pretty hard. Kepler's third law lets us do that. Here's how it works. Kepler's third law states that the period of the orbit squared is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed. We use T for the orbital period and A for the length of the semi-major axis. If these two values are proportional, it means that if one increases, the other must increase. Since one is squared and the other is cubed, an increase in A, the semi-major axis, results in a bigger increase in T, the orbital period. Here's another way to express this. T squared divided by A cubed is a constant. Let's say the Earth is one astronomical unit away from the Sun. Based on observations, let's say we know the periods of all the planets, and let's express those in Earth years. The semi-major axis of Earth cubed is one. Here are the squares of the periods of the planets. From that, we know the Earth, our reference orbit, the ratio for the Earth, our reference orbit. And then here's a mathematical formula using Earth's orbit as a reference. We use the square of the Earth's period over the cube of the Earth's semi-major axis to compute our constant of proportionality. Kepler's third law states that this ratio must be the same for all the planets. I'm assuming the ratio is 1 for all of them, despite what I showed you earlier. With a ratio of 1, the semi-major axis is equal to the period. The semi-major axis cubed is equal to the period squared. Here we set all the values for semi-major axis cubed and the other planets equal to the period squared. Here's what that equation look like, looks like. A cubed equals T squared over our constant. Here's the same equation with a constant expanded. We're using the period and semi-major axis of the Earth as our reference point. Here I solve for A. A is the cube root of T squared over the ratio we computed for the Earth, the period of Earth squared over the semi-major axis of Earth cubed. The period of Earth squared divided by the semi-major major axis of the Earth cubed is 1. And with that, I can simplify this equation. Taking the cube root of each of the periods squared gives us the semi-major axis for all the planets, or at least a very good approximation. If instead we need the semi-major axes of all the planets, we can then solve for the period t. t squared equals a cubed times the constant of proportionality, which in this case is the ratio of the Earth period squared over the Earth's semi-major axis cubed. T then equals the square root of A cubed times the constant of proportionality. Recall how we set up the estimation for orbital speed in the previous section. I broke the ellipse up into circular wedges and then computed the delta angle for each time increment. In the last part, I picked a period of one year or 365.2425 days. The delta area was thus equal to the entire area of the ellipse divided by 365.2425 days. If I were to compute the timing of the orbit of Mars, I'd use the period of the orbit of the Mars orbit around the Sun, 687 days. Delta A over delta T would equal the area of Mars orbit ellipse divided by 687. The area of the Mars orbit ellipse is the semi-major axis of the Mars orbit times pi times the square root of 1 minus e, the eccentricity squared. I'm not going to go much farther with this. As I said, the conventional way to determine the position of an orbiting body in a given time is with Kepler's equation, which I'll show you in the next part. So I showed you how to do this animation in the last part. And I mentioned in the code, I made the semi-major axes of the two ellipses different, but I didn't adjust the period. Again, this is wrong, and I'll show you now how to fix it in Python. Going back to the code I showed you in the last part, I want to adjust the timing of the orbits of the two ellipses so that the larger one is slower than the smaller one. I'm going to do this by adjusting the frames variable for each ellipse. In the way I wrote this code, frames is somewhat analogous to the orbital period. First thing I'll do is I'll create frames variables for both ellipses. 
And for now, I'm just going to set them to the frames variable. And here I'm updating each of the loops to use those specific frames variables for each of the ellipses. And I'll run this code to verify that it works. I like to make changes incrementally and then verify that I didn't mess anything up. Now I'm going to change the frames variable for the second ellipse and we'll set it equal to the square root of the semi-major axis of the second ellipse cubed times the number of frames squared divided by the semi-major axis of the first ellipse cubed. This results in a floating point number, and for the loops, I need integers, so I'll convert these to integers. I don't really need to do this for ellipse one, but for completeness, I'll do this for both loops. And now I want to make the eccentricities the same, but change the semi major axis of ellipse one to four. So now I'll run this code, and you can see that the orbit of the larger ellipse lags the orbit of the smaller ellipse. This is proper motion for two, two differently sized ellipses. Here's the proper timing. Notice that the two orbiting objects no longer converge at periapsis and apoapsis. That only occurs if the semi-major axes are the same. Here, one semi-major axis is four, and the other is five. While this Python code shows you the proper timing, it isn't very useful for orbital dynamics. I wrote this code primarily to construct this animation for presentation purposes. This shows you conceptually the difference in timing of two orbits. The periods differ according to Kepler's third law. The timing of the objects along each ellipse differ according to Kepler's second law. And the orbital paths are along ellipses according to Kepler's first law. Aside from that, this animation is not that useful. What I'll show you later are calculations that will let you predict and simulate real orbits around the Earth, the Sun, etc. The primary takeaways from this section are Kepler's third law, which states that the square of the orbital period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. That implies that an orbiting body with the largest semi-major axis has a longer orbital period as well as a longer path to travel. On a larger orbit, an orbiting body travels farther and slower. The other takeaway is that if you have a common central body with lots of orbiting objects, you can determine the semi-major axis of each object if you know the, the semi-major axis and period of one and then the period of all the others.